All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may become complete, well-equipped for every good work. Amen. That well-equipping word of the Lord comes to us this morning from Psalm 143, the first six verses. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my pleas for mercy. In your faithfulness, answer me in your righteousness. Enter not into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you, for the enemy has pursued my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me sit in darkness like those long dead. Therefore my spirit faints within me. My heart within me is appalled. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all that you have done. I ponder the work of your hands. I stretch out my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you like a parched land. This is the word of the Lord. Congregation may be seated. Mercy, grace, and peace are yours through your God and Father and through your Savior, Jesus Christ, your fellow redeemed. What do you think of when you think of Lent? Perhaps midweek services? Solemn hymns, maybe? Maybe even something as simple as fish fillets from a fast food restaurant. What does Lent, what does that word even mean? Well, really, it's just a Latin word, and it doesn't have some deep spiritual meaning. It simply means spring. That's about it. But of course, we know that Lent is spiritual, and we know what it's all about. It's about focusing on Jesus Christ and what he did for us and for the whole human race. It is a special time of year when we focus on the ultimate goal of our Lord, Jehovah. It is the fulfillment of everything that man has ever really hoped for. It is a time of year when we remember that even though we are sinful, our God is faithful. He forgives us our sins. The psalm verses we just read are part of a psalm, 143, that's known as or classified as a penitential psalm. Martin Luther called these psalms the Pauline psalms because they speak to the fact that we are sinful and God is merciful and forgives us. When you look at what this psalm is saying, what our text says, these first six verses, it does sound like something Paul himself would say. The basic flow of thought in this psalm is this. Lord, hear me. Hear my prayer. Be merciful to me, even though I truly don't deserve it. Be merciful to me, for my enemy is after me. and He is making me miserable. But then I think about what you did for me in the past. And therefore, I will keep praying because you deliver me. There is a certain realization that comes from such a penitential psalm. It's a realization we get also when we come to church every Sunday, every time we repent of our sins. It's a pretty simple truth, and one I think that is underestimated often. It's one that John writes about in his first epistle. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This psalm is saying something that we all have said before, and it's saying something that we should really say more. The psalm says what the season of Lent is truly all about. We're sinful. There's nothing we can do about it. Basically, the only thing we can do about how sinful we are is to state it, but it's rather obvious. It's not that profound. We're just calling a spade a spade. But the beauty of our God, the Lord, is that he is willing to forgive sinners like us anyways. That is what Lent is truly about. Us reflecting on our sinfulness and confessing it, that's the first part. But the second part is just as crucial. It is relying on the righteousness of the Lord to forgive us our sins. And so we pray, O oh Lord, sanctify us by your truth, for your word is truth. Amen. First two verses again. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my pleas for mercy. In your faithfulness, answer me in your righteousness. 
Enter not into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you. This psalm is often attributed to King David. After all, it does sound like a psalm that David would write. But what's not so clear is exactly what's going on in this king's life when he pens these words. Some assume that he wrote this during the time when he was fleeing from his son Absalom, who was, of course, waging a civil war against him. But it is unclear, of course, what the exact circumstance of his grief is here. Because from what we know about him, there are many things that happened to David that could classify as something that would cause him to feel this way. Yes, perhaps it was Absalom. Perhaps it was when the child he had with Bathsheba, his first child, died. Maybe it was when he was running away from King Saul, who he had sworn to protect, but then all of a sudden, Saul became jealous and tried to murder him. The situation that caused him to write these words could have been a whole number of things. But what is clear to us in this psalm and about David is that there is definitely sin present. He doesn't get into the specifics, as we said, but what is clear is that he knows and he says he does not deserve to be forgiven. This is not a David problem. This is an us problem. This is a mankind problem. Enter not into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you. That statement is true for King David. It's true for Ben Livy. It's true for all of us. What he is speaking to here is the biblical doctrine of total depravity. We are all sinful. None of us deserve to be heard by God, let alone be forgiven by him. We all deserve death for what we have done. And that fact is crystal clear. But that is the one thing that is always true. That's one of the reasons why we come to church in the first place. We said as much at the start of our service here this morning. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Those are the words found in another penitential psalm, Psalm 130. This is a footmark of the penitential psalm, admitting sin. The psalm does not end on a bleak note. It should, because, of course, we don't deserve anything else except for what our sins gets us. But how do these words continue in Psalm 130? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. The fact of the matter is that no matter who you are, you can totally relate to what David is saying here. We all deserve death and judgment for what we have done. Because this fact is painfully true, what David also says is true. We need help. Whom do we turn to receive this help? Well, the very same God whom we rebelled against and sinned against in the first place. How do we appeal to him, despite the fact that we know that we have transgressed his laws, we have openly sinned? Well, David knew it. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my pleas for mercy. In your faithfulness answer me. In your righteousness David does not start out by declaring all the great things he did for God. David was a mighty man, a man after God's own eye, and he certainly could have stated things that would put him in the so-called plus category. He defeated the great Goliath, who was supposed who was opposing the Lord's people and his nation. He served King Saul in humility. He penned many of the words in our Bible. He served the Lord. But that's not what David starts with. Instead, claiming how faithful, instead of claiming how faithful David was to God, David does the opposite. He states how faithful God is to David. He knows that God is faithful and righteous. What Paul wrote in 2 Timothy ever remains true. If we are faithless, he is faithful. He cannot deny himself. This is why this text is so on the nose for the beginning of Lent. Lent is the season where that fact is obvious. It's true. This truth has always been true, but this is the season when it is ever present. Why did Jesus go through the sham of the trial that was his encounter with Pilate? Why did he allow himself to be captured by the guards? 
Why did he allow himself to be mocked, to be whipped, to be brutally tortured? Why did he allow himself to be nailed on a cross and die? Well, Jesus Christ deserved none of those things, of course, yet he went through all of them. He did these things because he is God, and he is faithful and righteous. He did this so that we could have God's mercy. For the enemy has pursued my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me sit in darkness like those long dead. Therefore, my spirit faints within me. My heart within me is appalled. As we stated before, it's hard to really nail down exactly who this enemy is that David is referring to specifically. But just because we don't have specifics doesn't mean it isn't relatable. This feeling that he is describing is a feeling that I think we all have at some point in our lives. You can see the utter despair here that that fills the psalmist. The sheer depression and despair are evident. Have you ever felt like this? What is the lowest you have ever been to? What's your lowest point that you've ever experienced in your life? What happened to you to make you feel like this? Namely, helpless. Well, here, David is completely helpless, and he freely admits it. That's how you know it's genuine. Just look at the language that he uses here in this psalm. His enemy has pursued my soul. His life is crushed. He sits in darkness like a dead man. How does he feel? Inside of him, his spirit faints. His heart within him, he says here, is appalled. This is spiritual depression. Well, if you have lived in this world, then you know what this feels like. Adversity is never an easy pill to swallow, ever. It really doesn't matter what specifically David was going through here, because at the end of the day, we all feel like this in some way, shape, or form. We live in a sinful world, a veil of tears. It's not sunshine and rainbows. It's brutal. It bruises us and beats us down. Every man has a breaking point. Have you felt it? If not, give it time. It's inevitable that you will feel pain and distress. It's simply a matter of time in this sinful environment in which we live. Yet, it is in these dark and gloomy times where the light of our God shines the brightest. While pain and distress are never welcomed, they do serve an important function. It reminds us of a simple truth. We need help. There's no way we can go through this world and survive on our own. We can't go through this world without divine assistance. Whatever David was going through, he knew a few things here. Number one, he knew he was sinful. and He deserved whatever he was getting. But also, number two, he knew that he was helpless. This is a fact. Sometimes it takes us to get to our low, low point to realize that we need help. We need God. We like to think there's all kinds of solutions to our problems that we ourselves can come up with. Yet, when we go through situations like King David was going through here in this psalm, we clearly see that there's nothing that can be done by us. All we can do is admit as much that we are helpless, there's something we can do, and fully rely on God for our help and his mercy. Yet, when we contemplate these words here, take yourself out of the equation for just a minute. Focus on God and on his son, Jesus Christ. David starts this whole psalm off by declaring God's faithfulness and his righteousness. Put a Lenten spin on this, if you will. Put yourself in Jesus' shoes. He knew what he was getting into when he entered Jerusalem that holy week. He predicted his death several times, and he knew it was going to happen to him the next seven days. He tried to warn his disciples about it. They couldn't really see the lows that they would actually experience in in real time. But look at Christ's words in the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here with me. Then he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, 
O Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Yes, these words written in the psalm certainly are relatable to us. We freely admit that we probably have been through what this psalmist is going through. Maybe not the same circumstance, but definitely the same feelings. But instead of putting yourself in that mindset, put the sinless Son of God there instead. This is how Jesus felt. The enemy pursued his soul. It was not an enemy that could be seen. It was not Pontius Pilate or the Romans. Rather, it was a spiritual one. Why is Lent so long? Of course, it's good to reflect on God and on his mercy. We don't ever want to say there's too much church or anything like that. But why is Lent 40 days? Well, the reason is an event that occurred right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, right after Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. The Gospel of Mark says, Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. Lent is forty days long because it commemorates that first temptation that Jesus had in the wilderness, that first temptation of his ministry, at least. We don't know everything that happened during those 40 days. We know three specific temptations that he faced by the devil in a different gospel. But no doubt there were more than just three temptations. 40 days is a long time. What we do know is that Jesus was directly and actively tempted by Satan himself. This was not an easy time for Jesus. He was true God, he had all power, but he was also true man. The writer of the Hebrews puts it best when he says, We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. When we read the words here in Psalm 143, we don't just wonder about what David was going through, and don't just relate to the words yourselves either. They are relatable because, of course, we feel like this a lot, but rather relate to them and then realize that this was exactly how Jesus felt. He went through agony. He did this constantly, of course, in his life, and he felt like this all the time. But look at how he felt at the Garden of Gethsemane. He was so grieved that he actively sweat drops of blood. Jesus was relentlessly pursued by his enemy, the devil. That is the real enemy who pursues our souls as well. No one is exempt from this pursuit of the devil. We are all helpless. At least we really should be. But look at what David says when he reaches his breaking point in this psalm. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all that you have done. I ponder the work of your hands. I stretch out my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you like a parched land. What exactly was David remembering here when he mentions the days of old? Unclear as well. Was he referring to the deeds that were done in his past? Or was he remembering other deeds that were done before he was born? Doesn't really matter, of course, because whatever the case was, it would all point to the same thing. Listen to the words of another psalm, Psalm 77. And I said, this is my anguish. But I'll remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I'll remember the works of the Lord. Surely I'll remember your wonders of old. I will also meditate on all of your work and talk of your deeds. Your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? Perhaps David was thinking something of something in Israel's past, like maybe perhaps Moses leading the children of Israel, or maybe the judges delivering them. Perhaps he was thinking of something that happened in his lifetime, maybe when he defeated Goliath or some other military victory. It doesn't really matter what he was thinking of, because no matter what the circumstance, it would say the same thing. But what it say, again, it would say, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. That's another great function of Lent. When we come to church in this season, We're not hearing new information. We read these things, 
before, you know, read them again. We always read the same things in Lent. But the reminder is something that we always, always need. We come to church during Lent, and when we do, we too remember the things that happened in the days of old. We remember when Jesus went to the cross those hundreds and hundreds of years ago. We remember the things he endured, the flogging, the wormwood, thief on the cross, the betrayal from those who are closest to him, the blackened sky, the Son of God on the cross, forsaken by God himself. This is what we can remember when we are feeling low. It is the reason we can continue in this world. Jesus died for me. And as a result, I have his righteousness and his faithfulness. Have you ever been thirsty? Well, of course you have. What happened to cause you to have this thirst? Maybe you were in an extremely hot and dry environment. I get thirsty when I run. When your body is active, it naturally craves water. Look at what he says here. I stretch out my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you like a parched land. Think about how thirsty Jesus must have been in the wilderness. Forty days is a long time to go without food. Perhaps he had water, but he was definitely needing things. He didn't eat, and that is clear, and that's why Satan tried to tempt him to turn stones into bread. Or think about what Jesus said on the cross. One of the last things he said before he died was a simple sentence, I thirst. And we all have a thirst as well. Psalm 42 says, As the deer pants for the watered brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? It's true, we all have a thirst. We all have a need. It is something that only God can give us. Only he can satisfy our desire. What do we desire? We desire his help. We are helpless. We need God. Only he can provide us with that living water, that water that restores us. It makes us whole, makes us part of God's family, and ultimately delivers us to heaven. We, too, have a thirst for this living water, and we have been given it. When Jesus died on the cross, he guaranteed our deliverance, our entrance into heaven. Yes, we thirst, but Jesus satisfies us. Yes, there is a realization that comes from these penitential psalms. It's a very good reminder. It tells us we're sinful. There's nothing we can do. But we plead for God's mercy. We don't say, God, I'm so good. Rather, we say, God, you're good. Look at what you did in the past. I know that you will deliver me in some way, shape, or form. Because I look at what you've done in the past. Look at the deeds of the Bible. God always delivers his people. That ultimate act of deliverance was found at the cross on Good Friday. May God give us this knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Savior, during these 40 days and throughout our lives, and help us to remember that God gives us what we need, and he truly satisfies every desire, and we will be with him in paradise because of that. In his name, amen. Please rise.